don't agree with Thank you very much. I don't agree with everything that you're saying. Yeah. To the genocide claim. I'd like at this point simply make one observation that it's always a moot point who is exploiting whom. Uh, did Britain and, Fr Britain and Russia exploit the Armenians, or did the Armenians try to exploit Britain and Russia? You know, it is the duty of statesmen to make sure that you do the exploiting and you are not the victim of exploitation. Having said that, we want to our last speaker, because the genocide claim is really the one of the reasons advanced for Armenian terrorism <coughs> in recent years. We should work and make a special study of Armenian propaganda with regard to this claim. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lund. Over now, Mr. Gura. Excuse the function. Thank you, Dr. Mango. Just before my presentation, I would like to make two very short remarks following the presentation of Mr. Walsh. Uh, first, uh, when Mr. Robertson alleged that there is no debate about the label regarding the fate of Ottoman Armenians among legal scholars, I would just like to say that last fall, was published uh, in the European Journal of International Law, a journal edited by Oxford University Press, a debate between the chairman of the Union of Armenian Association in Suede and myself and retired Turkish ambassador Pulat Tadja. But maybe in the eyes of Mr. Robertson, a journal edited by Oxford <coughs> University is not very serious. Secondly, when Mr. Robertson uh, says that Raphael Lemkin is the main author of the United Nations Convention on Genocide, he is merely wrong. Because if Lemkin coined definitely the word genocide, his definition of genocide was rejected during the debate within the United Nations. So I am humbly suggest to Mr. Robertson to study law before to make this kind of arrogant <laughs> statement. So, thank you. Hundreds of attacks were perpetrated by Armenian terrorists during the 1970s and 1980s, and also some others during the 1990s. The majority of these attacks took place in democratic Western countries, and the early bombing uh, in 1983 was merely the most murderous terrorist attack on the of French history in time of peace. The support coming from the Armenian diaspora, or more exactly, from the nationalist elements of this diaspora, is commonly denied or forgotten. The close links between the political campaigns against Turkey regarding the alleged Armenian genocide and the terrorist attacks are similarly denied or forgotten. The memories of the Armenian terrorism himself are largely erased. Very few plagues or monuments have been erected outside of Turkey, and for the early attack, there is merely nothing. No plague, no monument, nothing. <coughs> Michael Gunter, who is one of the main specialists of Armenian terrorists, said that uh, he found smiling skepticism when he spoke to educated Americans about the very existence of Armenian terrorists. That's why I chosen this topic this night. The goal of this presentation is to explain how this terrorism emerged, or it was justified by distortion of history. Of course, many Armenians died, but we'll stress at this point. Genocide is another question. So justified by distortion of history, especially by the use of fakes. And finally, all this misuse of the past is continuing until today. So the first part of this presentation is about Armenian terrorism the rise of a political violence. First, the origin. The title of my presentation mentions the date 1972. Maybe some people ask why 1972, the first assassination took place in 1973, the campaign in 1975, why 1972? The first bomb threat by Armenian terrorists in this wave 
took place on October 21, 1972 in Los Angeles. Gorgon Yenekian, the first Armenian tourist of this period, took his decision to kill two Turkish diplomats in April 1972. But even more importantly, the World Congress of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Dashnak Party, which took place in Vienna in December 1972, decided the creation of a terrorist branch named the Justice Commandos for the Armenian Genocide. Indeed, as early as 1971, a group had been created within the AREF of Lebanon, but Palestinian terrorists, namely the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, quickly took the control of, the, of this group, which became eventually, in 1975, the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia, the other main Armenian <coughs> terrorist group. So, the new wave of Armenian terrorism in the end of 20th century is not the so-called desperate response to the refusal of the United Nations to include the Armenian case in the list of genocide in 1974. This is not the reaction of some young Armenians. This is, for a part, the decision of the main political party of the Armenian diaspora. The fact that the justice commandos were created by the Dashnak party himself was demonstrated by Gates Minassian, who is a French Armenian scholar in his doctoral thesis, and nobody made the slightest rebuttal of his findings based on the proper archive of the Dashnak party. This new wave of terrorism is not a parenthesis. The actual parenthesis in the history of Armenian terrorism is the 1945-1972 period. Indeed, from its creation in 1890 to the end of the Ottoman time, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation practiced terrorism widely, both against Turks and against loyalist Armenians. For instance, the main founder, the main creator of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Christopher Mikhailian, was killed by his proper bomb, preparing an assassination attempt against the Sultan Abdullah II in 1905. Bedros Kapamadjian, mayor, was elected of mayor of Van, thanks to the support, massive support of Turkish and Kurdish constituents, and he was killed by Dashnak terrorists in 1912. He was a great supporter of the Young Turks, in spite of he was an army. Similarly, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation organized a new terrorist network in 1919-1920, named Nemesis, to kill Turkish and Azerbaijani leaders, as well, once again, as loyalist Armenians. Not less than 200 people were on the initial list, but the ambitions were eventually reduced to some people. From 1926 to 1937, the Dashnak party's attempt to impose by force its hegemony on the Armenian diaspora led to several assassinations. Anti-Dashnak Armenian killed, or tried to kill, some Dashnak leaders in reprisal. The bloody clashes were interrupted only by World War II when the Dashnak party took the side of the Axis, namely Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. It is clear that the decision of 1972 was by no means something new for the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, but rather the return to a strong tradition. However, the return of the Armenian terrorism is not understandable out of the context of the Cold War. After having been pro-Nazis for years, briefly pro-Stalinist in 1945, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation became pro-American around 1948 and reversed against its stance <coughs> after 1965. The pro-Soviet stance became official during the Congress of 1972, the very same Congress which decided the creation of a new terrorist wing. Turkey was indeed a key member of NATO since 1952. Its importance was obvious during the crisis of the missile in Cuba. During the 1960s, the Soviet Union increased its ties with the Armenian diaspora, and it was a, more general, a part of a more general shame to destabilize Turkey by any way. After seeing the origin, let's see the scope. From 1973 to 1987, more than 70 people were killed by Armenian terrorists, including 30 Turkish diplomats, guards, or members of their family. More than 500 people were wounded. 
contrary to a legend, the majority of the Turkish diplomats were not killed by the Armenian secret army for liberation of Armenia, but by the Daesh activists. Contrary to the Nozar legend, it was not the Asala, but the Gistes commandos, which started the bombing in public places. The first one took place on May 29, 1977. Two bombs of Daeshnak terrorists killed six, Tur six Turks in Istanbul, five in Yeshikol Airport, one in Sakeji train station. 64 were wounded. The racist dimension of the Armenian terrorism is especially obvious in considering the bombing of Turkish cultural activities for instance, in Beverly Hills in April 1976, and in Los Angeles on June 3, 1981. Terrorism was also used as a way of intimidation against historians who did not accept the Armenian nationalist narrative. Stanford Show, professor at U University of California, Los Angeles, Ezel Kural Show, his wife, and their daughter, at that time 14 years old, were victims of an attempt of assassination by Asala, by bomb, in October 1977. In 1982, Stanford Shaw's office in the university was ransacked by Armenian students, and he had to leave to Istanbul for six months because there was a new attempt to kill him. And it was by no means an isolated case. The Cold War dimension of the Armenian terrorism is especially clear in considering the assassination by the justice commandos, by the Dashnak terrorists, of the Turkish military attaché in Canada in 1982, and of the Turkish ambassador in Belgrade, Gelib Baikar, also by a Dashnak terrorist, because Balkar was one of the most promising Turkish diplomats at the time. It was a direct attack against a key NATO state. Similarly, it is striking that the administrative attaché of the Turkish embassy in Bulgaria was murdered by justice commandos on September 9, 1982, and that the perpetrators were never arrested, and like the assassins of Gelib Balka. Communist Bulgaria was indeed a totalitarian country with an omnipresent political police. You cannot kill somebody in Bulgaria in 1982 without the agreement of the political police. However, Armenian terrorism was not only an extremely violent attack against Turks and against anybody who was assimilated to the Turkish side by Armenian terrorists, but also the expression of a deep hatred against actually most of the non-Armenian people, a kind of bitterness against the universe. Rogan Yanekian, who killed two Turkish diplomats in 1973, himself was very clear during his trial. The double murder he committed was also a protest about what he considered as the ins insensitivity of the world. Then, Armenian terrorists felt free to kill numerous non-Turkish and armed civilians, two Italians in Milan, 1980, one Swiss who was 15 years old in Geneva in 1981, one American in addition to eight Turks in Ankara Airport in August 1982, one French secretary in Paris, February 1983, four French, one Sweden, and one American in Orly, in addition to two Turks in Orly Airport, in July 1982. All these bombings were perpetrated by Asala, but in October 1982, the FBI arrested five Justice Commandos terrorists who wanted to destroy the building where the Turkish Consulate of Philadelphia was located. According to the FBI estimation, estimation endorsed by the U.S. Federal Appeal Court. The bomb would have killed at least 100 people or, in daytime, between 2,000 and 3,000. The leader of this Al-Qaeda-styled group, Vikan of Sepian, let's guess who we know, who is, is now a member of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation World Bureau and the chief of his party in the United States. In addition, in November 1986, another attempt of bombing by the Justice Commandos failed in Melbourne because of an error by the, committed by the perpetrator. Only this criminal was killed, but according to the police, many people, mostly Australian, would have been killed if the plot had been successful. This terrorism was not the fact, the fact of few people only. From the beginning, the Armenian terrorists received a massive support in the diaspora. 
as early as March 1973, a support committee was created raising $50,000 for Yenikian's defense, mostly from small donations, which means that there were thousands of donators. Remarkably, some of the leaders of the support committee for Yenikian were also responsible for the construction of the first monument commemorating what they called the Armenian Genocide in Montebello, California. Buses full of children from seven years old to 13 years old were sent by Armenian Association of Los Angeles to Santa Barbara, where the Yenikian trial took place to show to these children this is a error. Yenikian was sentenced to lifetime imprisonment in July 1973, and the appeal court confirmed the verdict in May 1974. But Governor George Duckmedian ordered to release him for health reasons in January 1984, and he died three weeks later. During this decade, 1973-1984, Gorben Yenikian received gifts and letters of congratulations. Hundreds of Armenian Americans attended his funerals, and some of them kissed his hands. The Armenian Reporter, one of the main Armenian American newspapers, independent of any political organization, and definitely not the most fanatic one, published regardless an apologetic necrology of Yenikian, saying that he opened a new era of political struggle and changed the course of Armenian history. No comment. For the Dashnak terrorists, it was, the things were even clearer. <laughs> the legal wings of the Dashnak party all over the world unconditionally supported the terrorist wing. <coughs> Official statements of the Justice Commandos were published in Dashnak newspapers, for instance, the Armenian Weekly in Boston or Ayestan in Paris. Inflammatory editorials were published to support and glorify Armenian terrorism, more exactly Dashnak terrorism. It is especially significant that one of the authors of such articles, which actually were barely more than calls for murder, Murat Frank Papazian, is now co-chairman of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation for Western Europe and also co-chairman of the Coordination Council of France Armenian Associations. When the Dashnak terrorist was arrested, he received the full support, financial and verbal. For instance, $250,000 was raised for Ampik Sassoonian's first legal cost. Mr. Sassoonian had been sentenced to life for the murder of the Turkish General Consulate of Los Angeles. He is still in jail. He is a single one. Quotes of Dashnaks attended the trials. Sassoonian trials, of course, a Kindian trial in Aix-en-Provence, France, in 1982. Beyond the place of the trials, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation organized support committee all over the world, especially for Ampik Sassoonian. Such committees were established in various countries of Europe and the Middle East. For Asala, it was the reverse. This terrorist group created political wings, mostly in France, United Kingdom, and United States. The political wing in France was led by Jean-Marc Akahara Doranian, who is now the other co-chairman of the Coordination Council of France's Armenian Association. In addition, a Comité de soutien aux prisonniers politiques arméniens, support committee for Armenian political prisoners was created in 1980 to support financially both Asala and Justice Commandos terrorists arrested in France, Switzerland, and Netherlands. The climax of the support for terrorism took place in the United States at the beginning of 1984 for the Sassonian trial. It took place also in France at the beginning of 1984 during the trial of four Asala terrorists who had attacked the Turkish General Consulate of Paris. In September 1981, and the trial took place also in the beginning of 1984. In spite of the Dashnak Asala clashes, the French Dashnak fully supported the Asala terrorists. Charles Davour and other French Armenian artists sent letters of support for the terrorists. So it is not only uh, the decision of few people or a political party. It does not mean, of course, that all the whole Armenian diaspora was involved in the support to terrorists, but a significant fraction was. Indeed, Armenian terrorism and propaganda nurtured each other. 
First, it has a current strategy of communication with some success and some failures. Class of attacks were chosen carefully to produce the maximal effect in the international media. Paris, 1975, 1979, 1981, 1983, record. Vienna, 1975, 1984. Rome, 1977, 1980. New York, 1980. And Brussels, 1983 are all known communications, place of international media. However, the trials of the terrorists were fully integrated in the strategy of communication. Gorgan Yanekian, inspired by Slogoman Teliayan, another Deshnak terrorist in 1921, wanted to transform his trial into, I quote, the trial of 1915. He failed largely since the prosecutor refused the discussion about the events of World War I, and focused on the actual case, a double murder motivated by racism. The appeal court confirmed the judgment in 1974. It did not prevent most of the indicted Armenian terrorists, their lawyers and their supporters, to use the genocide allegation as an argument, mostly in the 1980s. Yenikian's failures, however, gave a false impression to the Turkish side, and that's probably why no argument was provided during the trials of Mahdi Rosyan Gotchian, Asala, in Geneva in 1981, and of Max Khayer Kilindian, Justice Commandos, in Aix-en-Provence in 1982. The first one, the Gotchian trial, was a partial failure for the Turkish side since the murderer was sentenced to 15 years in jail, in spite of the efforts of the Swiss prosecutor. The second, war, the second trial was purely a failure since Max Raya Kildjian was sentenced to two years for attempt of assassination, not assassination, of course, and released almost immediately since he served already two years in jail before the trial. The Dash not called the Kildjian trial the trial of Turkey. And whatever you think about Armenian terrorism, unfortunately, it was partially the case. The Turkish strategy started to change with the trial of Paris in January, February 1984. Since Tulkayatov, professor at Ankara University, was sent as a witness to argue against the genocide claims, and a representative of the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul, Vikran Kevorkian, was also sent to refute the accusation of persecution or discrimination against the Turkish Armenians in the 1980s. However, it was, it was too few too late. Both the sentence and the media cover for the tri of the trial were highly disappointing for the Turks and actually for any people concerned by terrorism in general. The Armenian nationalist arrogance attained a climax. France Armenie, the Deshnak newspaper of Lyon, even wrote that seven years it was too much. Only the acquittal will be satisfactory. During the time of the Armenian propaganda successes, 1981-1984, the strategy was always the same, and the actors mostly the same. Speaking as few as possible about the murder case, or terrorist case, and speaking as much as possible about the so-called genocide. The same witnesses, self-proclaimed historians, testified in Geneva, Aix-en-Provence, and Paris. Jean-Marie Garzou, Julian, Gérard Chalian, and Yves Terman. Known is a historian. The first is graduated in literature, the second in sociology, and the third in medicine. None has ever made any research in archive, Ottoman, French, British, or any other. None has never been taken seriously by any review of Turkish studies or international law. Regardless, their books were crucial in the dissemination of the Armenian genocide allegation in the French-speaking world, and some of their publications were also translated into English and widely distributed by Armenian nationalists. The reputation of these authors increased as a result of their testimony in front of courts, and the trials were occasion to make advertisement for them. When you speak absolutely alone in a context where your contradictory speech is literally drowned in a flow of propaganda, you can say virtually anything without fearing real contradiction. However, the things started to change during the year 1984 as a result of a deal between President François Mitterrand the Turkish ambassador in Paris, Adnan Bulak, and the firm law, Gilles Loire et Noël. Robert Montrand, professor of Turkish studies at Aix-Marseille University, facilitated the negotiation. The Turkish strategies changed, and the plaintiff's lawyer, No, argued as much as needed about history, especially during the trial of the early bombing. There are two persistent legends 
regarding the early attack and its trial. First, the terrorists are supposed to have received heavier sentences only because they killed non-Turkish people. Secondly, they are supposed to have received no support for the, from the Armenian community of France. This is absolutely false. Indeed, other terrorists were, were judged right before and right after the, early trial, the trial of the early attack and received such sentences that their friends were furious, especially Avetis Katanesian, was sentenced to four years in jail in December 1984 for illegal stowing of explosives. When you are sentenced only for that, it's extremely difficult to be sentenced to more than four years in jail. Another Assad terrorist had been sentenced in Paris to only three years for an actual attack, not even two years before. So it's not only because all the perpetrators killed non-Turkish. There was a more general change in the Armenian trials. Secondly, the Committee de Soutien aux Prisonniers Politiques Arméniens, the support committee, sorry, the support committee to Armenian terrorists, fully accepted to defend the free terrorists indicted for the early trial. It's only because the chief of Asala had personal bitterness against the leader of the support committee that the strategy changed at, almost at the last minute. If the traditional trio of witnesses did not come to the trial, it may be less because of the enormity of the crime than because they were afraid of the cross-examination by Jean Loiret, the main plaintiff lawyers. This is especially true for Mr. Carzu. In the, edition, in the last edition of his book, he says very frankly that he was less shocked by the early attack itself than by the supposedly lack of support from the Armenian community and the perpetrator. So if Mr. Carzu felt free, he was very free to go but he knew that the course examination would be devastating. No. Uh, what were the arguments used uh, during the trials of Armenian terrorists? The main argument was the so-called Andonian documents, which were published by Aram Andonian in 1920, 1921, especially during the trials of 1982 and 1984. These documents are still today, until today, used by some self-proclaimed scholars. They are merely fake. Indeed, all but two were nothing, nothing functioned with. The duck paper is not the paper used by Ottoman. The cipher code is not the cipher code used by Ottoman. The signatures are not the signature used by Talat or by the pre governor of Governor Abdullaik. The formal aspects are not at all, and the content is not congruent with the actual facts. In addition, the so called Ten Command. A knowledge decision of doing, taken during a meeting of Ottoman leaders in 1915 in Istanbul are, are fake. It's the same thing. Formally, this text is not signed nor dated. There is not the shadow of material evidence of its governmental origin. And this document was not taken seriously by the British investigators in Malta in 1919-1921. And there is also a big chronological problem. This text is, this text is supposed to have been written between, 19, between December 1914 and February 1915. And Bayadin Shakur, a leader of the Ottoman Empire, is supposed to have been one of the authors. Mm -hmm. The problem is that Shakur was merely not in Istanbul at that time. He was in Erzurum. <coughs> Another argument used and still used today is a memoirs, or circulated memoirs, of ambassad American ambassador Morgenthau. In fact, as early as 1920s, some scholars found huge discrepancies between the actual US documents and what Morgenthau wrote in his book. Actually, he did not write the book alone, but it's secondary aspect. Uh, more recently, in 1980, a more comprehensive study proved that most of the allegation of Morgenthau in his book against Ottoman leaders are merely not substantiated by Morgenthau's proper documents, later report and diary. Even cruder, if possible, is the book of Medvedzadeh Rifat, published in 1929. Rifat pretends to be a former CUP leader. He was never a CUP leader. He was never a CUP member, and he was, never, he was not in Istanbul during World War I. He was in exile. Regardless, Rifat's books is still used until today, including by self-proclaimed historians. So in the third shirt and the part, uh, distorting the record, some example of contemporary propaganda in pseudo-scholar publication. 
Because no, since, since the second half of 1980s, it's more fashionable to use actual, authentic sources, but to distort completely their meaning. The first example will be furnished by the American sociologist, Vaak Dadouin. He says, Talat told interim ambassador Ohen Holler that the Armenian question is finished, is no more. La question armenienne n'existe plus. And Mr. Dadouin presents this quote as a clumsy confession of guilty. But in fact, Mr. Dadouin reverts purely and simply the sense of Talat's statement in presenting, it, in presenting it as a confession of criminal intention. Let's quote the document, it's short. On the second of this month, September 1915, Talat Bey gave me the German translation of various telegraphic orders on the persecution of Armenians, which he sent to the provincial authorities concerned. With this, he wished to deliver proof that the central government is seriously attempting to end the riots which have taken place against the Armenians in the heart of the country, and to see that those who have been deported receive provision during the transport. A few days earlier, earlier in reference to this, Talat Bey said to me, La question Armenian n'existe plus. The question Armenian no longer exists. The Armenian question no longer exists. So it's a complete change of the meaning of the source. Since I am pressed to stop, I will just say that Ottoman sources were distorted on a similar way, especially by the German sociologist Tanerak Cham. In conclusion, the continuities across the times is tricky. Albert discredited crude fakes are you, which were used to justify terrorist act are still used in so-called scholar publication on today. As long as it will be, remain fashionable in the Armenian diaspora to crudely acclaim terrorism, to use discredited evidence, and to attack viciously even the Armenian and pro-Armenian scholars who want to defend the genocide label with more rational arguments like Ilmar Kaiser or RSLFian, I see little hope for the needed reconciliation between Turks and Armenians beyond the individual level. This kind of unethical behavior must be opposed by historical argument and, if possible, by court case. Mm -hmm.